All right, in this section, we're going to introduce fractal dimension. And uh, it takes a little bit of a reconceptualization of what we mean by dimension here. Um, most of the time, I think people, when you think of dimension, you think of uh, geometrically, uh, like for instance, uh, length and width and height, and that would be three dimensions. So you think of mutually perpendicular directions. And uh, so these three dimensions uh, define three-dimensional space. And when you think of dimensions this way, um, coming up with the idea of fractional dimensions seems to be a meaningless idea. However, uh, there are other implications of dimension that can be generalized in different ways. And one of those is the idea of what happens uh, to a quantity when you scale something up. So if you scale up a triangle, for instance, and you double the sides, it turns out you double the perimeter as well. So you can think of the perimeter of a triangle as a one-dimensional kind of a quantity. On the other hand, you think of an area, and if I double the sides on a square, I get four times the area. So area scales like the second power of your similarity ratio. And the same thing with a cube. If you double the size of a cube, if you double the edges on a cube, you get... Um, 2 times 2 times 2, you get 8 times the volume of a cube. Okay, So we can think of dimension as defining how something scales up. All right. Now, uh, we're going to take a slightly different approach to this. Instead of scaling up, let's talk about dividing something into pieces. So let's uh, start with just this line segment. And I'm going to come up with two quantities here, a scaling factor ratio of uh, r, and then the number of pieces that I get, which is going to be n. So if I just take the whole thing, I have the ratio is 1, and I have one piece. All right. What if I divide it in half? So the ratio of the two pieces is now 1 half, and I have two pieces that result. If I divide it into fourths, turns out there's four pieces that result. And if I divide it into eighths, there's eight pieces that result. Okay. So, uh, notice that n is simply the reciprocal of r here. So 1 over r raised to the first power gives me n. All right, 1 over r would flip this fraction over, and so this would be an 8, and that's an 8. All right. Okay, let's look at a square now. If I look at the area here, if I um, if I take the original size is one, I have one square. If I uh, divide the side length in half, so the ratio here is one half, it turns out I get four uh, squares that result. If my uh, scaling factor is one fourth, then I'm going to get 1, 2, 3, 4 times 4 is 16. So 1 fourth uh, goes to 16, and so forth. Notice that if I take the reciprocal of r, I get 4, and I have to square it to get the number of pieces. Okay, So we can use that concept, the exponent here, uh, when I take the scaling ratio, uh, and I take the reciprocal of that and square it, that indicates uh, the number of pieces that I'm going to have. All right, So I can think of this uh, area as having a dimensionality of 2. So here has a dimension of 1, and here it has 2. Now, here is a new kind of object. It's not uh, just a single pattern that you could just simply draw with a pencil, because it's infinitely complex. Uh, we define it iteratively, because what we're doing is we're dealing with approximations of the final curve. Let's do it this way. If I start off with a line segment and say the length of the segment is 1, uh, and then there's one piece, all right? Take this line segment. So that's one third. How many pieces? By drawing that straight line as the length of this object, what I'm doing is I'm ignoring all the detail. But if I look at it at this scale, I'm able to uh, get more detail in here. And so I have four 
units of length, all right? So I have four pieces. If I make my pieces one-third as long, it turns out I can get four of them. What if I go a third of a third? So if I go one-ninth, okay, let's erase these. Now I have, I can get more detail. Notice I'm still ignoring a lot of detail here, but I'm getting more detail than before. And as long as I measure the length of it with these shorter measuring sticks, so to speak, the length I get is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Uh, so my count of the number of pieces is 16. Using our previous figures as a guide, let's look at 1 over r and raise that to some power and get n over here. This is going to be our formula for dimension. How do we find the d that will take the reciprocal of this? In other words, how do I take a 9 to some power and come up with 16? Well, I think you realize you have to solve this with logarithms. And so if I say d times log of 9 is equal to the log of 16. I'm just using natural logs. You can use any kind of logs. And it will come out the same, by the way. So d would be the log of 16 over the log of 9. So if I take 16 and take its log, take 9 and take its log and divide, I get... 1.26. Notice that came out in between 1 and 2. So using the idea of scaling, uh, it's possible to come up with um, figures that have intermediate results here. And where that extra dimensionality, that fractional dimension came from, is the complexity here. Notice that no matter how uh, short I make my measuring sticks, to, to put a straight line segment connecting any two points on this curve, I'm ignoring all the detail that lies in between. So as I go to smaller and smaller units of measure, I'm going to get uh, greater and greater amounts of detail. And so the dimensionality of this being greater than 1 is a way of saying we're not really capturing the whole essence of this whenever I use line segments. And I can only approximate this with line segments. Okay, so uh, that's the general idea of dimensionality. So we're going to use this as our basic definition uh, for the dimension of a figure. We're going to look at how it scales. If I start with the whole thing and look at self-similar pieces that are uh, reduced by some fraction here, and I take that to some... Uh, uh, exponent and that tells me how many pieces result okay so that's uh, something we've seen this formula works for simple one-dimensional cases and here's a two-dimensional case D would come out one or two and for something like this D comes out intermediate between those two okay I'd like to introduce you to another rather spectacular curve which is iteratively defined it's called Hilbert's curve and the thing this is known for is this is a space-filling curve. And we're, we're going to see that the Hausdorff dimensionality of it is actually 2. So even though it's a curve, it actually has the same dimensionality as an area. Okay. And the way it's done, iteratively, is we start by taking a square and dividing it in half each way. So our basic pattern is going to look like this. I'm going to connect the centers of these squares in this kind of a pattern. And I'm going to put little connectors on the ends, uh, so that will be our basic unit. And it turns out that I'm going to have to fold these uh, to make it all connect up as a curve. But basically it continues on to here and out to there. Okay, So that's going to be taken as one unit of the pattern. Okay. So uh, when r is 1, we get one pattern. Next, I want to reproduce the basic pattern uh, with these little tails on it again in each of these four quadrants. Okay, Let's go to another color. So let's first subdivide these. OK. 
okay? So uh, the ratio here is going to be one half, and let's uh, reproduce this curve. I'll switch colors here. So um, in this top quadrant, I simply do it as before, and in the top quadrant here, I do it as before. And on these, I'm going to rotate them so they face uh, outward like this. And then we add the tails. At the bottom corner, I'm going to make it come out and over, same as I did initially. And then in between, I'm just going to join up the, um, the spots like that. Notice that in each of these four quadrants now, I have like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And in the original, I had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So each of these uh, is the same length as the original. So the number of copies of the original is four. Okay. So let's go to the next level. So I subdivide each of these. And this time, let's use red. Okay. So in this, um, so for this top quadrant, I'm going to reproduce this pattern uh, up here in this little piece. So I'm basically going to start with this and this and this and this and connect them up. Okay, uh, up here I'm going to do the same thing except it's sort of flipped around. So I do this. And then here. And here. And then join these up. Join these. Come down. Okay. So here I'm going to come and over and over and downward. Connect these up and finally over here, it's like a mirror image of that one, I come uh, like this. Um, And then connect these up. Okay. And this can be repeated. I have left enough squares on here to do it one more time, but it would just be very time consuming. Um, again, let's see what our uh, ratios are. Uh, notice this time we have one fourth. And I have of the basic pattern like this, I have one, two, three, four. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, and sixteen. Let's figure out the dimension according to our formula. So if I take the reciprocal of r, I get two to what power gives us four? Or we could equally well say four to what power gives us sixteen. And notice in each of these cases, you can see without even using logarithms, that d equals 2. So here is an example of a curve that actually has two dimensions, even though it's a curve. Okay. Now this curve itself, this red line I've drawn here, is not the Hilbert curve. The Hilbert curve is the limiting case as I repeat this process over and over again. And you can actually prove that this curve will pass through every single point in this region. So I can take any random point in the region 
and you, it's possible to come up with a, a formula that will tell you how uh, many iterations of this curve you need before it will actually pass through that point. Okay, the examples we've been using so far are very contrived mathematical constructions, uh, curves defined iteratively um, that are infinitely self-similar. Okay, uh, you might wonder, is this of any practical application? Well, it turns out that one of the early researchers in uh, fractals is a guy named Benoit Mandelbrot. By the way, he actually does pronounce the T on his name, even though it doesn't doesn't, doesn't follow normal French pronunciation there, but Benoit Mandelbrot. Um, he did a paper uh, looking at earlier research on the, the length of the coastline of uh, Great Britain. And this paper, by the way, it's quite interesting. It's a short paper, and you can find it on the internet. In fact, I'm including a list of links uh, to various internet sites related to fractals uh, uh, with the material for this chapter. So you might want to look in there. What Mandelbrot noticed was that the distance around a country, uh, especially one with a rough coastline or with natural boundaries like mountain ranges and rivers and so forth, tended to be very difficult to measure. And in fact, uh, the, the value you get for these lengths depended greatly on the size scale you were uh, looking at it with. So if you're looking at this coastline uh, in this, this case, we're using 200 kilometers here. And so you just basically find points on the coastline that are 200 kilometers apart. Uh, what you come up with is one distance. If you cut the length of your measuring stick in half, you don't simply get twice as many. You get more than twice as many. And so the overall length comes out greater. And the reason you get more than twice as many is the you're skipping over a lot of the fine detail at these crude resolutions. As you increase your resolution, you pick up more detail. However, there's a lot more detail still left to be discovered. And so as you go to finer resolutions still, you get to a lot more detail and continues all the way down. Now, does it go infinitely? Well, that's hard to say. In fact, once you get down to the size of a grain of sand, of course, you're going to have a very bumpy curve even at that scale, but uh, it's hard to define what do you mean by a coastline, which grain of sand is, uh, defines the coastline. Okay, So it eventually sort of degenerates as you get down too small. But the general idea is that coastlines uh, behave like fractals uh, to a large extent, at least statistically. In other words, any section of the coast uh, would look rough at approximately the same degree of roughness if you're looking at a one mile stretch or a thousand mile stretch, um, just depending on how much detail you're going to take in in that process. Now, if you look at the original paper, the formula that Mandelbrot uses is a little different than the one we've been using in this text. So I'm going to take a minute to look at that. He says that the length is proportional to uh, g to the 1 minus d. Now g is the length of one of these um, measuring rods here. Okay, So initially we would take this and let's call this g naught and that's going to be our 2 kilometer length, excuse me, 200 kilometer length. And then this one would be a different g which would be uh, half as big. This would be a different g which is a fourth as big and so forth. So this is similar to the r that we have. In fact, if you take g compared to the initial g, that's what you could think of as r. So the ratio, the scale, what is the scale of the measuring units here compared to the original? In this case, it would be one-fourth, but in general, it would be g compared to the original g. Okay. And the other thing is he's measuring this not in terms of how many measuring rods, but in, in terms of the overall length. Uh, the number of measuring rods would be the overall length divided by the length of one of the measuring rods. Okay, so with these two substitutions, we can convert our formula into his formula. And the reason I'm doing that is I think it, when you get into uh, trying to work with uh, this kind of data, uh, Mandelbrot's formula I think is easier to work with than the original one we used in the book. The one the book's using looks like this. 1 over r to the d dimension uh, gives us n. Okay, 
Let's make these substitutions and see where we can come up with this proportionality. By the way, notice that a proportionality is the same as an equality. If I say L is equal to some constant times g to the 1 minus d here. Okay, Let's make these substitutions. So if n is equal to L over g, let's write that here. So we have L over g in place of n. And r is g over g naught. So if I take 1 over r, it's going to be g naught over g. And so that's raised to the d power. Okay. So let's turn this around algebraically. Let's expand this, bring this g over here. So I'm going to, let's turn it around also. So let's take L over g is equal to g naught to the d power divided by g to the d power. If I bring my g to this side, multiply both sides by g, notice that g to the first power divided by g to the d power, uh, this would be g naught to the d, and this would be g to the 1 minus d. Okay, so if I'm dividing two numbers with the same base, we subtract the exponents, okay? Notice that uh, g naught is just some constant, so g naught to the d power is just another constant. I could relabel that, say, k, so we can get L is equal to k times g to the 1 minus d. And so we can use this as our equation in terms that are going to be more useful for this kind of problem. One of the problems in your problem set is going to be similar to this, and I suggest you go ahead and use this form of the equation, and it'll be a little bit easier to do the problem compared to using the original. To use the original, you just have to, if you know L and G, uh, you'd have to simply calculate N and R, and then you can uh, go ahead and use them from there. It's not that big a deal. Let's use this to actually compute the fractal dimension using these numbers that are provided. This illustration, by the way, came out of uh, Wikipedia, and so here's the little permission reference there. Uh, let's look at this. What we have is a table of values. I have L and I have G. So if G is 200 uh, for this first diagram, uh, the L we get is 2350. When G is 100, L is 2775. And when G is 50 kilometers, uh, the L is 3425. Okay, look at this uh, equation here. I can get d out of the exponent if I take the log of both sides. So the log of L is equal to the log of k plus 1 minus d times the log of g. Okay, so if I plot log of g as my x and the log of L as my y, the log of k is simply my uh, intercept, and 1 minus d is my slope, okay? So, simply by plotting the log of uh, l versus the log of g, I can find the slope, and that's the, really the quantity I'm interested in. I don't really need to know this. So let's try that in GeoGebra. All right, here I've entered uh, the same data. I've turned them around, by the way, because I wanted G to be on the x-axis and L to be on the y-axis. Actually, I want the log of G versus the log of L. So here's our basic data. Here I'm going to just say equals log of, and then I can say that. And I can just drag that formula down to apply to all of those. And in fact, I can just drag it over because uh, these are relative references. So this is uh, simply the log of whatever this is, two cells to the left. This is the log of what's two cells to the left. Same thing, okay? So these are the data points we want to plot. I come over to create a list of points. And now let's uh, shrink this way down. In fact, I can, uh, here, let's turn it off entirely. I'll turn off the spreadsheet for now. And let's zoom in a bit. All right, uh, these points are sort of linear in a downward slope like that. I'm going to put a best fit straight line. 
Notice that these points are incorporated into this list called list one. So I'm going to say fit line square brackets and then type in list one. And there's my best fit line to this data. Now I can take this equation and put it into y equals mx plus b form. And notice that the slope is minus 0.27. That's the number that we're really interested in. Okay, we found that the slope is minus 0.27. And that's equal to 1 minus d. So let's solve for d. So if 1 minus d is equal to minus 0.27, let's bring the d to this side and this to the other side. So d is going to equal 1 plus 0.27 or 1.27. Okay, so to the accuracy of the data given in this example here, uh, the, the coastline of Great Britain has a fractal dimension of 1.27. If you had wanted to do this using the books method, we would take the data and come up with new columns that would give us uh, the ratio R and the number of sticks in each case. And so if you plot the log of 1 over r versus the log of n, you'd get the same result. Okay, try out the problems. Uh, this is sort of an interesting, fairly subtle kind of a topic. Fractals are being recognized in more and more places in the natural world. So these concepts actually have quite a few applications.